In this final segment of this lecture, we're going to talk about the anchoring heuristic and framing effects. The anchoring heuristic is easy to remember. If you've ever had someone tell you that first impression matters, first impressions matter a lot. The first impression that you have of some person or some event or some mathematical equation anchors you to that point. It's very hard to move away from your first impressions. So for example, this uh, gentleman here, if my first impression of him is uh, when he's dressed as a doctor on the left versus when he's dressed as sort of a biker dude, sort of, on the right, uh, my later feelings about that guy are gonna differ based on my first impression. In other words, the first impression is an anchor that holds everything else down. And you can move an anchor, but it's hard. Let me give you an example of us using an anchoring heuristic in a condition where it doesn't make any sense. This is a great study. Imagine that you walk into a room and the researcher says, okay, tell me the last two numbers of your social security number. And let's say one subject says the last two numbers of my social security number are, is 11, and a different subject says the last two numbers are 99. Okay, so these are essentially random numbers. Then the experimenter puts a bottle of wine in front of the person and asks the person, how much do you think that bottle of wine is worth? The people who just said the number 11 are going to think that that bottle of wine is worth less than the people who just said a high number, say the number 99. They're going to think that bottle of wine is worth more. That's the anchoring heuristic. As soon as you ask somebody for a number, that number anchors later judgments, it influences later judgments, even if you know that that number is totally unrelated to the judgment you're making, right? There's no relationship in the world between the cost of a random bottle of wine and the last two numbers of your social security number. But that's the example of the, uh, of the anchoring heuristic. Companies take advantage of this all the time. If you shop on Amazon, they always list two prices. And you might wonder, why do they always list two prices? Well, the first one, they cross out, and then they give you the second one in a larger font. The first number is always larger. Sometimes it's maybe equal to, but it's never less than the second number. In the US, in English, we read from left to right. So we always come across the small crossed out number first, the bigger number first, and then that makes the second number look like a better deal. Macy's does this all the time. I can barely go into a Macy's. They'll walk in and they'll be 75% off of these sheets, right? And I'm thinking, wow, I need five. In reality, you know, it's 75% off of some price that no one would pay. But to me, that's 75% off. Wow, that's an anchor. It makes it look like an incredible deal. Here's an example. Look at this equation real quickly and come up with your first guess. Don't work it out. Just give me a feeling for how much you think it, it adds up to. Probably thinking one times two, two, two times three, six, four times six, 24, I don't know, 250. In an experiment that Kahneman and Traversky ran, half the subjects got that equation the way you just saw it, and the other half of the subjects got the equation the way you see it here, with the bigger numbers first. Now, if I've got to take my first guess, I'll look at those first two numbers, seven times eight, 56, 56 times six. Oh, that's a big number. So I'm gonna guess, I don't know, 2000. The first numbers that we see anchor our estimates. And when you ask people to do this task, what you find is that people who are given the numbers in the second order with the big numbers first, they give a number that's four times bigger <laughs> than people who, uh, than the answer, the average answer to the first equation. Even though obviously you look at them, they're identical. The truth of the matter is we're terrible at mathematics because the answer, actual answer is incredibly different from anybody's average answer. But what I want you to see is the anchoring part of this. The last heuristic I want to tell you about is the framing effect. And you need to know the framing effect to get around in life. The framing effect says the way in which you ask a question, so how you frame a question, determines the answers that you'll get. It has a very strong influence on how people answer questions. And um, we're right in the middle of the COVID pandemic and I've seen so many examples of the framing effect this weekend. I just had to put them in the slides. Um, someone on TV was interviewed and said that they were going home for Thanksgiving because they love, they love their family too much to stay away from them during Thanksgiving. Now, 
I get it. I understand we're all lonely and isolated in the middle of the pandemic and they love their family so much they can't stand the idea of not being with them. But if you reframe their decision, it's a little different. I love my family so much that I will risk killing them with a virus, especially the most vulnerable people in my family. Ah, or requiring me to wear a mask means we live in a dictatorship. Okay, nobody likes to be told what to do. Absolutely, I understand. But did you drive here on the right-hand side of the road? <laughs> Someone told you to do that too, and somehow that doesn't make you a dictatorship? Oh. <laughs> okay. Parents know all about framing because they learn that the way they tell their kids to do things determines whether the kids are gonna be compliant or not. So for example, it's a small difference in wording, but parents know they'll get a big difference in reaction if they say to their kids, if you finish your dinner, you'll get dessert, versus saying exactly the same thing, but framing it differently. If you don't finish your dinner, then you don't get dessert. The first one, if you finish your dinner and you get dessert, puts the control, the perceived control, in the kid. The kid's got control of the situation. You want dessert? Just finish dinner. It's up to you. The second one is punitive, right? So you get a big difference in reaction. So framing effect says the way you present information has a big influence on the decisions that people make. And this has very important everyday consequences. So for example, let's say you go to Food for Less to buy some hamburger. They could label that hamburger 25% fat, or they could label that same hamburger 75% lean, because what is not fat is meat, right? Um, but they never ever say 25% fat or 20% fat. They always label hamburger as 80% lean, 75% lean, the flip number. Uh, politicians use the framing effect all the time. If they want to talk about how great the economy is because they're the incumbent and they want to be reelected, they'll use numbers that talk about how terrific the economy is, how what percentage of people are working. They'll talk about rates of employment. When politicians want to get rid of the old people and be the new politician, they talk about unemployment numbers. They frame the country's success or failure differently. For all of you going into the health services, framing effects are literally have life and death consequences. The way doctors and nurses frame uh, information about treatment decisions. So imagine you're an oncologist, you help people with uh, cancer. The way you talk about uh, cancer treatments to your patients is going to shape the decisions that your patients make. How do we know this? Well, this was actually done in a study of people who had lung cancer. Back in the 1980s, there were really only two treatments. There was surgery um, and there was radiation. Surgery was more likely to extend your life, but there was a small chance you could die from it during surgery. Radiation is less likely to extend your life, but it wouldn't kill you immediately. So here's what they did in this study, real life study. Half the subjects were told about the two options and they were told either there was a 10% chance of dying from the surgery or that the surgery had a 90% survival rate. What happened? The patients who were told that there was a 90% chance of survival from the surgery, 82% of those people opted for surgery. Of the people who were told the same thing, right? If something is 90% likely then the only thing left is 10%. So people who were told there was that 10% chance of dying, 52% of them opted for the surgery. So it's a 30% difference in decisions that are going to determine how long someone lives. So this is really big. Another important implication uh, is in terms of how you get compliance with um, rules or behaviors. So for example, in Europe, there's a tremendous variation between countries on what percentage of the population is willing to have their organs donated when they die. So in California, on our driver's license, we just check a box that says, if we want our organs donated to medicine upon our death or not. In Europe, 
huge difference in the percentage of people who say, yes, I'll donate my organs, and yes, I won't. Why is it? It's all a framing effect. Of the countries that assume you're going to donate your organs and you have to check a box not to donate your organs, that's an opt out. 99% uh, of those of the populations in those countries volunteer to donate their organs. On the other hand, if you have to check a box to opt into being a donor, then the donor rates vary between 4% and 25%. Same choice, do you want to donate your organs? But look at the difference. Those are framing effects, and that's the end of this series of lectures. Thank you.